thank you. We will now hear evidence from G4S and Sedexo. And again, just for the record, could we uh, introduce yourselves? Surely. Uh, Jerry Petherick, I'm the Managing Director of the Offender Management Business Stream of G4S, Care and Justice Services. Thank you. And I'm Kate Steadman. I'm Director of Government Strategy for Sodexo Justice Services. Thank you. First question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Interested in how uh, the offender management works at present, and whether or not you think that the the norm structure as it currently stands is going to work. My view is um, the revised norm structure gives a clarity which we've been seeking for some time, and I think the separation into distinct uh, business streams is positive and good, and certainly my initial um, experience is that there is a much clearer definition of the expectations and work. I, w I would echo that, really. I think it's... Um I think it's a clearer structure. I think it's smaller. Um, I, w I would say that I think there could be greater clarity given to external stakeholders about the structure of MOJ. Obviously, they're still going through a transformation process, but I still don't think that's entirely clear to people outside the department. Um, but broadly, I'd echo that and the ending of the regional structure being an improvement in simplification. In implementing uh, this bill, do you see the opportunity for further cost savings in the structure of norms? I think, as Kate said, the removal of the regional tier has helped and is giving the clarity. My belief is that the further savings would come through greater assimilation of both the custodial uh, work and the non-custodial work. And I think not only would there be cost savings in that, but it would be a more effective end-to-end -end system because increasingly it's a work that I see um, either before people come into custody, whilst they are, but particularly through the gate, and especially where any mentoring type um, opportunities exist. Um, as far as my understanding goes, and um, the time that a full-time job allows one to study a bill in such detail, I don't think the bill makes particular changes to the structure of norms which would create savings. It's more changes that perhaps would be enacted to... Um, um, and which might perhaps result in lowering the prison population, which would create savings. Um, I think the main savings have been made in the criminal justice system are through reducing reoffending, and there's nothing particularly in this bill that I think wouldn't would act against that. But I don't see any particular structural changes to norms or possibilities for that within the bill. And what about the um, the working in prison? What what do you think the best way of that is being implemented? Can I just clarify, the working prison, the 40-hour week yes, and so forth? Yes, exactly. Um, certainly at three of my establishments we either already have or are very shortly introducing elements of that and I think this will be an incremental drive and certainly our experience is that it's possible, it's right, that prisoners and staff actually um, value it. It's particularly valuable when we have links with external companies and organisations. There are risks, obviously, um, in introducing it, but I think there has been incremental spread to build the culture, um, because some establishments plainly won't have the facilities that will enable them to have a widespread 40-hour working week. Um, I, I echo that again to a degree that I um, welcome very much the government's call for increased work in prisons. I think it's the right thing to do, both for, um, both for reparation to victims in that respect, punishment, but also for rehabilitation for skills and um, increasing the chances of employment on release. I do think that um, it's a very difficult policy to enact, and I think that will take a lot of hard work. I think this bill does make it easier in many senses, um, well, certainly with... Um, being able to enforce a deduction from prisoners' um, earnings. However, I do think the policy is going to be very difficult and it will require more than legislation. I'm, I think the government is well aware of that, but um, I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions to be raised about um, space in prisons, about the flexibility, in particular public sector prisons, I think, to introduce full working days. I think the mm -hmm. private sector have it slightly easier in that regard because we can be more flexible with our staffing. 
Um, and I think there are other questions about the local job market, which I think are being worked on, but it is a big challenge, and I don't, I don't underestimate that. I think overall the biggest thing in my mind that needs to happen is actually a culture of businesses coming into prisons, which I don't think has really been fostered yet. I think there's still a stigma in some regards attached to that quite wrongly, and I think that's the biggest thing in my mind that needs to change. Okay, just before we move on to the next speaker, I'm conscious there's a number of speakers yet again wishing to speak, so answers briefly, please. And for fairness to members, there'll be one question and one supplementary. Ellen Goodman. Um, you've said that you think in extending the amount sure. of time which people, uh, which prisoners should work will be difficult. What do you see as the resource implications in moving from where you are now to a 40-hour week? So how many more prison officers would you need in order to run that in a prison? It will vary from establishment to establishment and indeed in terms of culture. We've managed it with a very small increase in staff, but we, we're lucky, and let me be absolutely clear about that, in some of the estate that we have, it's new or relatively new. We have workshops um, that are built for the purpose as opposed to converted. I think the real issue is that of the cultural mind change. Um, that, um, and I've now spent 29 years in prison management and I've seen people being very reluctant to have prisoners unlocked in small pockets around the establishment. We need to change that culture and have done. We need to make a prisoner's working life much more similar to those that we have. And we introduce porter cabins as canteens at the place of work, for example. So we have to make sure of security and safety. But the actual resource is about changing shift patterns and making sure that we are maximising the usage of that, as opposed to a large-scale increase in numbers. And do you think you can do that at the same time as there are 23% cuts uh, in the criminal justice so that, that, so that the contracts you are making at the moment are presumably less generous than they were five years ago? Mm -hmm. That's obviously the challenge to ourselves and we've got to be innovative in the approach and that's the type of work that we are doing. We do need the external companies and we're seeing, to be quite honest, an increased number of people who are prepared to take prisoners in employment, both within the establishment but more importantly to me, outside the establishment because research shows that a prisoner who has gained the work ethic in prison actually does value his or her um, place of employment afterwards and employers are finding they've got a more stable and often more committed workforce which has been trained to very high standards. Okay, Damien Haynes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you mentioned a couple of times both, I think, about changing the culture to enable more work in prisons. How, how do you change that culture, bring in more partners um, to introduce the sort of high-value work that allows deductions and could still ultimately be turned from a cost centre to a profit centre, and then ideally also integrated perhaps via the work programme with uh, post-release uh, work programmes as well? I think there's two elements to that. There's the culture inside the prison, and then there's the culture outside the prison. Um, in terms of public sector prisons, I would have lef less experience of that, but um, in order to incentivise um, governors who don't already have an incentive, and, and many do, the policy exchange report, um, for example, published recently on giving um, an overhead fee to the prison for every out, out of the prison wage. That's one interesting idea. Um, I think also, as I said before, it's a problem with flexibility in the, in the public sector, um, in the core day, which um, obviously makes things difficult on a Friday. Um, so that's a real challenge. I, I think the bigger challenge there, as I said, is the external, is the external right. culture. And I think changing that is very difficult, particularly at a time when unemployment is rising on the outside and there's very careful political decisions to be made there. I do think there's a lot of work being done by the Ministry of Justice behind, behind the scenes. Behind the, I, I think there's a lot of um, work being done by the Ministry of Justice behind the scenes to engage employers and large organisations, and I really welcome that. I don't know if it would be possible to do that more publicly and to make more public pronouncements, and if there's perhaps a governmental championing of this, really doing something to change the sort of reputation that, you know, um, work, working in prisons is bad. I think there are lots of big corporations who do work inside prisons, but they hide it because it's somehow dirty. And I think that's the biggest thing um, that needs to be done to change and, that. And can, I mean, can it ultimately be a profit centre both for the partner firm and for the prison? I mean, I, I, how do the economics work? There must be some scale curve relating to hours in a week and 
numbers of people involved. So how does that work? What does it take to get to the point where there's, a, there's an active incentive on the financial sense as well as the responsibility sense to... I, I personally think it has to be a financial incentive, on, 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 um, certainly on the external side. You can't expect people to do out of goodwill, and I, I don't think anyone is expecting that. In terms of the actual finances of that and how it works out, that's too complicated to answer. In my opinion, on a general basis, that would depend on all kinds of um, profit margins. But it can, be, right? it can be a profit sense on both sides. That's, that's really the I question. I agree too. Yes, yeah. I mean, my response would be, yes, it can. To get there, you have to have great resilience. Um, lots of hard work, lots of contacts at a number of levels, the CBI level, the local chambers of commerce level, and you actually have to get out there and market and explain and host job um, work fairs for local employers and so forth. One of the problems is it can be very small scale and bitty, and the real issue is about scaling it up. And that's where organisations such as Transco, Timpsons and so forth yep. come in. It has to be a collaborative effort, and we actually do need to drive the message. Undoubtedly, there are financial benefits potentially for both sides. Yeah, thank you. Alex Cunningham. Thank you. Uh, how will you be able to guarantee safety in an environment uh, where prisons, prisoners are more mobile within a prison estate? And, you know, even in a situation where people may be reluctant to actually engage with work, what does that mean in terms of staff numbers, appropriate staff numbers, such as prison officers who will be needed to supervise prisoners who are more mobile? In any establishment, be it public or private, um, safe systems of work, risk assessments and so forth, undertaken to ensure that. And some of that is a matter of judgment. In my experience, a busy prisoner is a safer prisoner and a happier prisoner because they're actually engaged. Because if there are large levels of inactivity in a prison, boredom comes from that and we have control problems born out of that. I've known that through various times in my own career. And so um, if you make work attractive, and that can be from the training point of view, from the rehabilitation point of view, from the financial point of view, there is a buy-in from the prisoner which actually um, breeds safety. So you don't think that having prisoners, m many more prisoners moving around a prison in different work environments will require greater supervision from prison officers? There's always a risk when you have people out, and that's where the professionalism and the risk assessments come in, and you make sure that you have sufficient staff. No one, and I certainly wouldn't, no one would advocate having unsafe staffing levels, unsafe working practices. So well, you need additional people, though. That's, that's the point. Do you need additional to, at a time when there are cuts in the system, do you need additional people in the system to supervise prisoners when there's more of them mobile within the community? I can't accept a generic statement that you need additional people. You need to look at how you're using your current resources, <coughs> and you may be reprofiling those resources, making more effective use of them, and so forth. In some instances, you will require more staff, and that's where the economic um, element comes in, because if you're bringing in more income, you can actually afford to have more staff. But I, I would refuse a suggestion that across the board there aren't sufficient staff already in the system. There will be some locations where there aren't, there will be other locations where there are, and you have to do that on an individual establishment risk assessment. But reducing numbers isn't going to be the key. Ben Wallace. I, I think it's right, I should give up my spot. Cunningham has got all the answers I require about it. Paul Compe. <laughs> Could I just pursue, pursue you a bit on, on what you are doing as businesses in terms of, for instance, hosting jobs fairs? What are you doing to get these businesses into your prisons? Because you're going to have to do that if you're going to deliver a, a work programme. Um, we, um, we are in the process of a systematic engagement with um, outside organisations in order to bring in further work into, into the prison. We also already have a lot of workshops going on in our prison um, <clears throat> with qualifications attached and they range um, according to gender, according to all sorts of things and there's a, there's, there's a lot already provided, however we are trying to up that. We're also trying to um, introduce things ourselves, we've recently um, <coughs> developed a proposal which we're beginning to implement now, which is to take all of our company's UK printing business, put it inside one of our prisons, 
Um, it's currently disparately outsourced. It will now be done by prisoners inside a print shop in the prison, with run as a social enterprise with all profits going half to victims and half to local resettlement charities. So we are doing a combination of external engagement and bringing our own work and trying to, uh, into the prison to increase things. Already, um, but they're already fairly. Um, we're we're operating at almost a 40-hour week in several of our prisons already. Very much the same internal external supply chain at Oak Course Prison. We hosted the local Chamber of Commerce on two or three um, work fairs and we've had great benefits from that, not just in terms of work coming in, but as someone suggested earlier, the change in attitude that people outside who have never been in the prison often see prisoners as being unemployable. And when we start getting that interaction, people realise that these are very genuine people who have, through whatever reason, ended up where they are. The other avenue... Very, very, very brief. Time is moving on. Tom, do you have a supplementary? Yes, I do. Are, are you actually planning to make any physical adaptations to your prisons to enable you to do more of this work? Yes. And that's an ongoing issue, because as we change the work stream, and we're currently changing a workshop at Oakhurst Prison from one type of work into a light engineering training and production facility. So inevitably, there have to be changes for that. Andy um, uh, From the answer you, you've given to my colleague, it does seem that you're going to have to be asked to do a lot more with less resources. Um, there was also an announcement yesterday um, by the Minister that there would be a new tendering process. I think one of, your, one of the G4S prisons yes. coming to the end of the world, but eight further prisons. Are you intending, at the same time as you're coping with uh, those, those tensions with the, in your existing work, are you intending to expand, are you intending to bid for any of those contracts? We have a meeting tomorrow which will define that, that I would be amazed if we weren't, and we're mm -hmm. obviously gearing up our resources to do so. But it's an interesting point. When you, you say your resources, are your uh, uh, management staff and are your staff generally, do you generally recruit from within the prison service? I mean, do, I don't know what the background of, of each of the, uh, you, Ms. Perlick, Ms. Stedman, is in relation to that, uh, or do you tend to take people from outside, from other professions? Increasingly, it's a mixed economy because traditionally there was only one source, and I came through that source personally. We also, again at Old Course Prison, had the first director who came, who joined as a prison <coughs> custody officer, and is now director. And increasingly, the reservoir of talent and experience is such that we're beginning to see that pull through. And indeed, we obviously utilise international experience as well. All of our um, directors, obviously in the private sector, governors are called directors. All of our directors um, have um, very long and um, impressive public sector experience. Um, the rest of our prison staff are taken from um, a mixture, I would say. A lot of them are, are fresh staff. However, I should be pointed out, um, with regards to this new tending process, obviously all but one of the prisons are currently in the public sector. So that poses very different questions for where you get your staff from. Um, as Got a the and things like that, yeah. yeah that uh, is that your own, your own background in the prison service? I'm so sorry. Is your own background in the prison service? Is my... Own background in the prison service? Um, no, it's not. No. Okay. Thank you. Robert Butler. Thank you. Can I, can I move on to curfews? Uh, the bill, uh, in two ways, I think, most notably in terms of sentence, extends the amb potential ambit of curfews, uh, 6 to 12 months, 12 to 16 hours. Um, I, I'd like to know, and I wonder if you could just give some evidence about the system, the expansion, and how you as a service are going to be able to cope with the expected increase in, 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 in the use of tagging and, and, and electronic devices relating to curfews. I think from my perspective the increased use of technology and new technology and indeed the flexibility, particularly if given <coughs> to offender managers, can bring huge benefits. I, bringing some international work. In Norway, people are actually curfewed the night before they should be going to work, and that seems to me a very intelligent use of it. I spent a night um, back in December actually out with our field teams and talking to people who were coming to the end of their tagging period, and I was amazed talking to them, and it was an education for me, just how restrictive they have found it and how successful they have found it. So the intelligent use, the more flexible use, the refining of it to make sure that people turn up for unpaid work or whatever. 
I think, will change lives positively. We don't currently um, provide electronic monitoring um, services. Um, obviously, that's coming up for tender again soon. That may well change, but uh, I don't know. Um, traditionally, as an organisation, we've taken the view that we're very values-based and that we don't enter into pieces of business unless they have a predominantly rehabilitative element. Um, and electronic monitoring, has, as it has been structured in the past, is more of a monitoring service rather than something which... We, we believe has the ability to really impact on people's lives in the bits that the private sector provide. Can I just have a supplementary? I mean, you, you're developing the points about the changes in technology to make the system more effective, and you mentioned unpaid work. Um, I mean, is it an evolution from just a, a monitoring service to a service that is actually much more intrusive, potentially, in terms of uh, you know, regulating the activity of the individual who is tagged? I have to show some dissent from the fact that it's only a monitoring service because my experience is it was far from that yeah. because I saw field-based officers actually interacting not just with the person but with their environment and with the family. And um, I've, see, I've listened to the cause at the other end and there is a lot of interaction. We can do more. Obviously yes. we can do more. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is going to be more intrusive, but actually I think that's what the public yeah, wants. Yes. And actually... I'm not being critical. No, no, no. It's but thing. it's also the individual on the tag actually wants, because most people do want to be taken away from the practices that have led them to that position. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, Thank you. Um, to what degree do you believe that the provisions of the bill will impact on your ability to meet the um, special needs and circumstances of women in prison? Um, I don't, unless I've missed something, I don't think that the bill touches in particular on women um, and really has a particular impact on them. I think, I think there are some, some measures which could be seen to strengthen community punishments and community sentences, which I think um, can only be a good thing for installing public confidence in them so that sentences feel able to um, hand them down on more occasions. Um, and that is obviously favourable to women when they are carers of families. Um, but otherwise, I, uh, it's one thing I would say that I don't think the Green Paper focuses in particular on women. I think the strengthening of the community sector issues can only be good in that way, particularly if we give flexibility to offender managers at the local and regional level to have more impact on refining some of the um, restrictions, because then we can be looking at um, tagging people for different curfew periods to allow them to attend schools with their children and so forth. There are heaps of ways that innovation and um, entrepreneurialism can help in that way. You've both alluded to the fact that there's no specific uh, focus on women either in the Green Paper, I think you said Ms Stedman, or in the Bill. Do you feel it would be useful to progress the proposal that the previous government took from the Corston Review of having a women's champion in the penal system? I, I personally think champion or no, it doesn't particularly matter. I think it's the policy that comes out that's important and how, and how that's done, it's to me neither here nor there. Um, I, think it's, I think it's difficult as a service provider to comment in, on detail on sentencing proposals, um, to be frank. Um, but as a personal opinion, I welcome the recommendations of the Corson Report. It's just a matter of really, um, in a criminal justice system, which in my view needs quite a lot of reform, and I think this bill and um, government policy goes a long way to achieving that, where you focus your time and resources on. <coughs> Women are a very important population group. Um, I don't doubt that at all. Um, but I understand that there are also a small proportion of the prison population. My personal view would be to challenge NOMS to make sure that they are providing that insight. And I've seen various ways that's been done in the past. Okay. Damien Hayes? No, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the importance of financial capability um, in rehabilitation and the implicit intent to increase the prevalence of payroll deduction saving schemes, but more, more importantly, how that can best be integrated with sort of wider financial capability programs in prison, of, of which there, are, there seem to be some pilots, but a little bit patchy, and also how you can integrate that to um, uh, involve with mainstream financial services upon release. I, 
A lot of this is in how you prepare and explain it to prisoners about what it's for. And again, um, at Oakworth Prison last year, we gave four and a half thousand pounds that prisoners had donated from their wages to local victim support charities. And it's the expectation that we've created that prisoners there will either, well, will both save some of their money, and on average, people have been in that group have been leaving with £250, which may not seem a lot, but it's a start, mm -hmm. and have given money to charities. So I think it's setting the expectation. We come back to cultures, and it's about doing that. We then have to work, and I know that um, Sodexo work very closely with a particular bank to provide bank accounts, and that's something that we're looking at. But. Yes, thanks. We won a Guardian Public Service Award for our co-op bank scheme at Forest Bank um, and the finance gap for prisoners is obviously something that needs um, serious work. I think it's improving. Um, I don't have any particularly <clears throat> additional strong views on that, I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Helen Goodman. I want to follow up on the question that Dana and Heinz has just asked, I think it's a very important question. When I came to Peterborough, and you very kindly showed me around, Kate, uh, we came across uh, a story from one of the people who worked there of a woman with an infant uh, for whom housing had not been organised before the day of release. And I have since discovered that for women leaving mother and baby units across the system, that's quite a common practice. So I was wondering whether, you've said a lot about cooperating with the private sector, but I wonder what you would feel about a duty to cooperate with public sector agencies, local authorities, housing associations, PCTs, to ensure the kind of um, seamless support that people need, which, which Mr Hines was really alluding to. Just to clarify, if I may, as, as far as I'm aware, if I understand correctly, in that case it was that the prison discovered that the, the local agencies had not um, prepared housing for the offender who was being released, and the prison intervened to ensure that it was done before she was released. I don't think there was any absence on our part. Yeah. Um, but um, obviously, um, I, I personally think this great divide between the sectors in all areas of government that's is ex existed historically is out of date. We worked very closely with local agencies in the public sector. We worked very closely with voluntary sector organisations, and we are a partner. Um, I don't think any one prison or any one agency can exist on their own, working in silos. And we work, we work extremely closely with all different local agencies on release and pre pre sentence to um, to give offenders the proper joined up care as far as is possible. I think. I think the real issue is that you, we all have to stop looking at prisons there, community there. We've got to work through the gate and to do that I think we have to jointly create a very effective, very professional mentoring process through the gate and they're trite words in many ways. People use it time and time again but actually the transition from custody for any prisoner, male, female, adult, youngster back into the community is a real risk and I've seen it time and time again and it's where you actually have someone that that individual can turn to to really make the transition. The real problem, the under 12 month sentence people who don't have any statutory supervision, in Wales we have a transitional support scheme which is a professional mentoring scheme for any prisoner from male, female from any prison going back into to South Wales, um, and we actually see the impact of the mentors, some of whom are ex-prisoners themselves, and have gained this experience. And actually, yes. I mean, I think we, I think we all recognise good practice when we see it, and I think we're all agreed that the St Giles Trust are doing great work in Peterborough, for example. But our object is to ensure that best practice becomes common practice. And my question was about. Uh, putting duties onto prison authorities to cooperate um, so that this happens all the time, not just some of the time. See, I have to say, I take that as read and I expect my directors to do that. And I would get very irate if I found examples where they wouldn't, and I'm sure Kate's the same. We're contractually obliged to do it's, so. 
it's really again creating that culture, that expectation. And we all know that going forward, this is going to be a major element of the work and the uh, specifications, and I'm delighted about that, because actually it's a further driver in that way. Thank you. Tom Pick? just wanted to check something that you would said, Mr. Pedrick, to make sure I understood it, in terms of tagging. <coughs> are, are you saying that tagging is now able to act as a sort of GPS device in terms of people being able to go somewhere and you being able to track the fact they've gone there and then come back following a particular route. That technology is increasingly available and will, I believe will be a feature of the new bits. Is it in use already? Not in the UK, in other jurisdictions is my understanding. And your technical understanding of it is that it, it, it works effectively there are no risks associated, or no more risk perhaps in the existing system? Or? That's my understanding. I have to say I'm no technical expert, but that's certainly my understanding. And I'll write to you, sir, after That'd this, if you would like. Yeah, thank you. Alex, can you to return to your appropriate facilities in prison for delivering the work programme. Mr. Pell, you said that you're an, you were an experienced uh, prison officer, so doubtless you have experience of older prisons as well as new prisons. How difficult will it be, in your opinion, to deliver this more comprehensive work programme in the older establishments, perhaps with over a thousand prisoners? And what kind of investment do you think will be needed in order to make it uh, fit for purpose? Firstly, sir, I would say it's not necessarily a function of size. It's more of um, old <coughs> gate lodges, etc., admitting lorries and so forth of the requisite size. So, again, very difficult to give a complete across-the-board uh, figure. But I can remember when I was the area manager for the South West, Exeter Prison had an incredibly narrow gate lodge. So any uh, vehicles entering, that would cause problems. I had Channing's Wood Prison, which was much more modern, and we didn't have that. Issues. So some of it is purely about access issues, and some of this has to be about scale. I believe in any prison you could find something to actually encourage the 40-hour working week, and then you scale up from there. So it's very hard to give a generic answer because it is uh, related to individual establishments, but the culture is such that you can start the process. Yeah, but with your experience, how much of the prison estate do you believe is not ready uh, you know, in order to deliver this in view of the large number of older prisons? Hard to give the answer, to be quite Ask. honest, because, no, I wouldn't have thought that. And I come back to the point I was making where sometimes you have to start with um, smaller workshops that you can manage, and from that you begin to build the work culture, etc. So the it other take a long, long time in order to get yeah. a sort of comprehensive yeah. programme that's other, envisaged. The other point I would make is that the very aged prisons tend to be the local prisons where prisoners go through and out into the training estate, quite rightly, where the um, facilities are much more available because the local prisons, as you'll know, actually serve a particular purpose. And so that's where I would see the growth. Jonathan Rent. Thank you, Chair. Can I <laughs> ask you both something that I'm interested in, which is about drug and alcohol treatment. Um, can I just ask you, do you support the introduction of compulsory drug and alcohol treatment in prisons? As details in the bill? Yeah. I think anything that encourages offenders into drug and alcohol treatment is a good thing. I think it's one of the biggest causes of crime and the biggest problems affecting our society. I think most people on the outside tend to have this view that most people in prison are um, inherently evil and uncurable and I think in most cases they're actually there because of some social problem, drugs and alcohol being a, a huge, a huge proportion of that um, and I think on average only about 5% of orders in the community are currently, currently drug and alcohol related um, and it's the proportion of offenders suffering from such things is much higher than that. The answer my personal answer to your question is yes, I do, because very often people need that initial drive to take them through that first period of resistance and so forth. And is, there, I mean, is it simply a matter of making it compulsory and that's how you get to that point? I mean, are there any problems for you in, the, in that approach? There are going to be problems with any approach, to be absolutely honest. And um, yes, 
I can foresee some problems, but I can also reflect on other times, including the introduction of mandatory drug testing, where I thought this is going to be a real issue, and it wasn't, to be quite honest. And I think a lot of it is about how expectations are set, and more importantly, how they're managed at the interface. Yes. Yes. Just to wind that up a little bit further um, and talk about wider prison health services, what will the effects of privatising prison health services be? Well, increasing in the new bids, they aren't privatised because for in the experience I'm having at the moment with Birmingham and Featherston too, the local PCT um, commission the healthcare service and I actually... Um, feel that's the right model and my assumption is that will continue going forward. My understanding is it, it, it will continue that prison, prisons that are currently in the private sector, they won't have their contracts entered in terms of healthcare but they'll, um, as contracts come up for renewal, they'll move over to PCT basis, that's my understanding from Department of Health. Okay, Andy Swan. Uh, for, for what you've said so far there seems there are going to be quite significant changes in the way that your prisons are run. There may be capital works, staffing changes, presumably staff have to be trained. How does that work in contractual terms? Do you uh, renegotiate your contracts? Do you have supplementary contracts? The initial specification will set out expectations as to the level of work, um, time out of cell and so forth. If we want to negotiate a change to that, either we or indeed the authority can uh, submit a notice of change for consideration and so forth. I would be surprised if we went to the authority to say we want to change this workshop from A to B because that would be down to our management of it and we would um, incorporate any costs in our business model and business case for any particular change. I'd just like to clarify that I think um, certainly in most of our prisons that substantial changes would not be required to introduce a um, 40 hour week. Mm. Not substantial changes anyway, just to clarify that. I'm slightly surprised by that. Uh, what, what sort of hours would you anticipate prisons to be working at, at present? Well, some of our workshops operating in Forest Bank, for example, mm. one of our prisons on uh, mm. 37 hours a week, mm. so it would require very little change to have an extra yeah. three hours. We have the resource and the modern design and the flexible staffing arrangements to do that. So um, you won't be going back to the uh, MOJ and saying we need more money or we need uh, substantive changes into, into the contract we already have. You'll simply be uh, coping with the changes which the bill introduces within existing resources. As far as, as far as my understanding goes, yes, we certainly won't be asking for more money. Um, I don't think there are any other contract changes that would have to result from that, as far as my knowledge of contracts goes. Mike Kate, our workshops are working at that kind of level already. Um, and obviously we have the uh, benefits of being relatively recent operations, and so we're developing our own culture, have developed our own culture. And a lot of this I do come back to is about cultural and organisational changes, and that can come down to shift pattern changes and so forth. But that might not be true. Sorry, Andy. Oh, sorry. sorry, I didn't hear what. David, 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 David. Thank you, Mr. Sheridan. <laughs> Twice. Um, I wanted to ask about payment by results and uh, social impact bonds, which touched on a number of these issues that have come up drug and alcohol rehabilitation, the work programme, so as well as overall rehabilitation. It, it strikes me, there are, and these are new areas, of course, and everyone's sort of coming to terms. It strikes me there are six challenges with um, PBR and, and social impact bonds, which are defining the audience, isolating the impact of interventions, uh, defining a control group, having measures of success, the fact that savings will come from different budgets in the public sector, and there's a danger of double counting, and finally that cash flows, positive cash flows, may happen over a very long time, during which there may be two or three or four changes of government. Um, it strikes me that with stopping reoffending, um, you've got the most perfect kind of model uh, for dealing with those six challenges. But even within um, that issue, even within that challenge, how big uh, a potential do you see ultimately for payment by results and social impact bonds? I personally think it's two slightly different questions. Um, payment by results, I think the, the logic is um, to a degree flawless. I mean, you can argue with the fact that if it works, you get paid. If it doesn't, you don't. Um, we are obviously at one of our prisons, Peterborough, piloting the association yeah. on there, which is 
going very well. It's also been a learning process, obviously. But um, I think um, payment by results has a positive future. But I think the devil will be in the detail in a lot of these cases, and we have to see how it goes. Um, I can't pretend it might be, will be the solution to everything. But as, as an order of magnitude, 1%, 10% or 100% of, um, of the ex-offender population, do you think could be covered by programmes uh, which ultimately could be funded by social finance? Uh, but see, that's a different question. That's going to be my second answer, which is social impact bond versus payment by results. They're two different things. Social impact bond, as far as I'm aware, is when the money comes from social investors in yes. the community. Um, as opposed to private finance and yes. things like that. Um, I don't know to what degree there is, um, at the moment anyway, an appetite for social investment to the degree to which you can meet every offender coming out of a prison in England and Wales at the gate to fund that. Yeah. Whether that will change when the proof of the concept has taken place, I don't know. But I think social investment um, will be interesting to see how that goes. I think PBR is more general and different. I think that's much more promising, if that makes sense. To a degree, I, th I think, to be fair, I think social impact bonds are kind of a subset of payment by results. So there's, there's, you have lots of payment by results programmes of which some are suitable for social impact bonds. And in fact, in the list of six challenges I gave, I think the first four apply to all payment by results programmes. The second two apply particularly to social impact bonds. But I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a sense, and I know it's impossible to say with accuracy, but just a sense of how big this could go. The pilots of Peterborough seems to be quite encouraging. How, how far can it go? How, what percentage of the uh, ex-offender uh, population could be covered? I'm so sorry. I would say, I would add a seventh, I think, challenge, and that's of scalability, which is implicit in the other things that you say, because yeah. I think the real issue is about the pace and the scalability of the pilots and so forth. Um, certainly, we are up for payment by results, it is the way forward. We're getting experience through the Welfare to Work programme of that, and I think we'll take a lot of learning from that to into uh, the criminal justice sector. And we're, at the moment, um, conducting a type of lessons learned survey from our initial work, which, again, I'd be very happy to provide to the, um, the committee when it's completed. Um, so I think the appetite's there. As Kate says, the devil will be in the detail. Okay, Dave Watts. I was interested to uh, hear your response to the early question about your relationship with the public sector, and specifically about the woman who was leaving. And as you, I think you said, and we, the prison found out that the local authority hadn't provided, provided housing. Doesn't that indicate that there's a, a gap between the relationship between the prison? and the public sector, the relationship doesn't seem to be what it should be. If I'm totally honest, I can't recall the exact detail of that precise case. I do, I'm not based at that prison. This was t took place uh, with a visit with the shadow minister, and it was a member of staff who was relaying this anecdote about how the prison actually intervened to ensure there was housing. I, to be I completely frank, I can't remember whose fault it was, who failed to do what in the process, but it's um, without doubt in my mind that, as, as Jerry said, the relationship between the prison and the community is where the answer to reducing reoffending lies, and, it's, and, and all our prisons are designed towards achieving that. There's no doubt about that, that for years and years that's been the cliff edge. No matter what you do to prisoners while they're inside, if you let them fall off the edge without support on release, then it's useless. So I can't comment on the individual case because I really can't recall the no, detail. I, 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 I absolutely agree with you, but that's why I'm trying to pursue yes. that point because it seems to me there's a gap there from what you tell, what, what you indicated. And it doesn't seem to be within the bill, and I'm, just, I'm asking for a comment right. on it. It doesn't seem to be a joining together of the probation service, youth offending teams, etc., in a way that is likely to lead to, to stop people from reoffending in the future. I think it's far better than it used to be, and mapper arrangements for those who come into it obviously help. I can recall in my previous life, I was one of the first members of the South West Reducing Reoffending Committee. And I think particularly pertinent because it's easy to identify someone to lead on the police matters, someone to lead on prison probation, etc. The real problem we had was to identify someone who could lead on local authority for a very wide geographical area and a very dispersed. Oh, and no, no, I'm sure you can finish your answer and write to Mr. Mr. Watts if that's at all. Yeah. Just to leave uh, many thanks to both our witnesses for coming along and thanks for your patience.